everyone to New Hampshire Civics and the William W. Treat Lecture Series. My name is Mary Susan Leahy, and I'm the board chair of New Hampshire Civics. Today's William W. Treat Lecture is about citizenship and the habits of good citizens. Our lecturer is Dr. Richard Haas. Dr. Haas is President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. He recently published his acclaimed book, the one we'll be discussing today entitled The Bill of Obligations, 10 Habits of Good Citizens. I would like to say a few words about the William W. Treat Lecture Series and Judge Treat. The lecture series is now 12 years old. It has hosted many notable speakers. The inaugural William W. Treat Lecture was held in 2012 and featured United States Supreme Court Justice David W. Souter. The lecture series is made possible by a grant from New Hampshire Humanities and with the support of the William W. Treat Foundation. So, who was William W. Treat? Judge Treat was born in 1918 and died at the age of 92 in 2010. In a nutshell, Judge Treat was a good citizen and he practiced the habits good citizens practice. He was a family man born in Maine and spending much of his adult life here in New Hampshire, where he was active in law, banking, politics, and diplomacy. He was a probate judge here and was the founder of the National College of Probate Judges. He was an author, including a three volume set text on New Hampshire probate law, which is still used today. He was the founder of a national bank here. He served on numerous corporate boards and was an active supporter of many civic organizations. He was appointed as an ambassador to the United Nations by President Reagan in 1987, where he served on the Human Rights Committee. Judge Street was elected in 1988 to serve as the US member of the United Nations Subcommittee on Human Rights, where he co-authored with his Soviet counterpart, a report on international standards for a fair trial. Dedicated to the cause of human rights, he traveled to East Timor in 1992 to encourage discussions between Indonesian leaders and dissidents. Judge Street was a firm believer in a meaningful discussion and the thoughtful exchange of ideas. In keeping with his commitment to civics and the community, in this next hour, we'll explore with Dr. Haas our duties and obligations as good citizens. Additionally, five New Hampshire high school students from across the state will join the discussion and answer segment of this program. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria manis Show, today's moderator. Thank you, Susan. And again, welcome to New Hampshire Civics' Treat Lecture based on Dr. Richard Haas's book, Bill of Obligation, 10 Habits of Good Citizens. We'll start our event with an introduction of Dr. Haas, followed by an overview context setting of the book and a brief discussion, after which we will be joined by the five high school students from around the state of New Hampshire for our Q&A segment. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Richard Haas, a veteran diplomat and respected scholar of international relations, the president emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, after having served as CFR's president for 20 years. He is also senior counselor with Centerview Partners, an international investment banking advisory firm. Dr. Haas previously served in the State Department under Presidents George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan at the White House under George Herbert Walker Bush and at the Pentagon under Jimmy Carter. He was US envoy to Cyprus negotiations and the Northern Ireland peace process. And after 9-11 was US coordinator for the future of Afghanistan. Dr. Haas is the author or editor of 14 books on American foreign policy, one book on management and one on American democracy. His latest book, the Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, was published by Penguin Press in January 2023 and became a New York Times bestseller. He also authors a weekly newsletter, Home and Away, available on Substack. A Rhodes Scholar, Dr. Haas holds a bachelor's degree from Oberlin College, the master's and doctorate of philosophy degrees from Oxford University, 
and numerous honorary degrees. He is the recipient of the State Department's Superior Honor Award, the Presidential Citizens Medal, and the Tipperary International Peace Award. Dr. Haas, who was born in Brooklyn and grew up on Long Island, lives with his wife in New York City. Welcome, Dr. Haas. It is so wonderful to have you with us here today. Well, thank you, and uh, it's great to be with you all. We're excited to talk about your book, um, especially with so many things happening in the world today. Um, I'd like to start a little bit with getting a, a sense of the framework. With, in the first part, you talk about rights-based democracy and illustrate how the landscape has changed and the impact that has had. You articulate the rights and their limits and then provide context on the democratic deterioration. So essentially you're providing the current state of affairs and how we got here, a historical perspective, which is critically important to us. So talk about the shift from what we refer to as the statesman approach. When we look at Congress people and um, they always were elected and had the best interest of the country first and foremost in their minds. And that has shifted to a WIFM approach. What's in it for me? Can you talk about this flip and how that has happened over time? Well, again, it's good to be with you all. And it's also just really good to see this kind of interest in our democracy and our political process in this of all years. Uh, 2024 has the uh, potential to be a critical year what some are calling a hinge year in, uh, in, American, uh, in American history. So again, uh, I applaud what you and your colleagues are doing. I'm not sure if uh, our elected officials uh, always put the country first. Indeed, uh, if they did, they had a strange way of showing it. Uh, what I think is true now, though, and we're seeing it, is the degree to which people are putting persons or parties first, though, has, I think, uh, increased. Or to put it a different way, I think the situation's gotten gotten worse. It's gotten more uh, difficult. And, you know, why this is the case could have something to do with uh, how we fund our politics. I think social media has something to do with, do with it. Uh, conven more conventional uh, media has, has uh, something to do with it. The fact we haven't done a good job of teaching civics in our school. We haven't done a good job of teaching what I would call global literacy in our school, the relationship between what goes on in the world and what happens here. I think this explains, for example, some of what's going on in uh, Washington, all these things these days, the uh, refusal, for example, for the United States to, to continue to provide assistance to Ukraine even though it's two years since Ukraine was uh, invaded by Russia, and even though uh, Ukraine is fighting for something that we, we ought to be supporting, which is a world that is governed by certain rules, the most basic of which is that one country should not acquire the territory of another country by, by force. Yet we can't at the moment rally uh, a majority or what, because one of our two political parties won't, won't support that in the House of uh, Representatives, which is quite stunning for me. The idea that this is controversial is not something I would have uh, thought or, or predicted. So for any number of reasons though, uh, and you know, we could debate that, I think the situation's got, gotten worse. People are looking more at special interests, party interests and personal interests rather than the collective national interest. But however we got here, as somebody once said, we are where we are, where we are. And the question then is, what do we, what do we essentially do about it? Because clearly where we are is not good for this country. To your point, this morning on the news, they talked about um, the proposed legislation for closing the border and what mm -hmm. the president has been willing to do. And um, it also tied to Ukraine funding and Israel. And it's unbelievable to even conceive that a party would block this because it's the best piece of legislation they've ever had for border security. And yet, because it isn't in keeping with what the party wants, I don't remember it being like this before. What as we, as citizens, as voters, 
what can we be doing to communicate to our mm -hmm. uh, congressmen and to say this is unacceptable? Uh, again, I think it's uh, it is worse than I recall. I understand the logic of not supporting the bill dealing with the security of the southern border. I, uh, I think it's it's dead wrong. I think the bill ought to be passed. I think uh, it would be it would leave the country better off, considerably better off. But at least I understand the political logic of opposition. I don't agree. I, just to be clear, I don't agree with it, needless to say. But I understand it because I think there are those who want this issue to remain unresolved. They want it to fester because they believe it would be politically advantageous to Republicans and to their presumptive candidate come November. Again, I don't like it, but I get it. What I don't understand is the political logic of opposing aid to Ukraine. Uh, polls show uh, uh, a majority of Americans support it. And you know, I, I think, again, it, it's, it, it, it may simply stem from a desire not to hand President Biden some type of a political accomplishment uh, maybe simply a reflection of traditional isolationism, may have something to do with some inexplicable sympathy for a tyrant like uh, Vladimir Putin. I don't know, but uh, there I simply don't see the logic in any way, in policy terms and political terms, uh, you name it. Look, what voters can do, and I'd say it's a more broad point, I think it's an important question, is voters have to make clear that there will be consequences for people in public office doing things either they agree with, there'd be positive consequences, or if they do things they disagree with, there'll be negative consequences. And you know, the, the, the way I would like to characterize it is politicians often are not responsible, but politicians are almost always responsive. They respond to political uh, pressures. To, to do certain things if they'll be rewarded or not to do certain things if they'll be penalized. So that's on us. That's on the voters. We've got to send clear messages to those in Washington and say, if you vote against, say, this legislation on providing militaries and economic support to Ukraine, or if you refuse to pass legislation that would make the border more manageable, that would help reduce this influx of, uh, of, of people who ought not to be in this country, if you support those things, we will we will we'll be more likely to support you, either with money or votes or what have you, or volunteer to work for you. And if you oppose these things, we're going to go out and support your opponents. And you know, obviously, we'll have a chance to do that come November. But it's a long time between now and November. It's what eight nine months. So I think it's important that people indicate that certain positions uh, are setting uh, politicians up for defeat in November, and maybe that will get their attention. But I think that's the main, you know, the first two obligations that I talk about are one, to be informed, and two, to be involved. So this is a moment, I would argue, for American citizens to get informed and then to, and then to, get, to get involved. And at the end of the day, the political res process uh, responds to that. So a couple of things that you said I, I don't want to lose sight of. You mentioned earlier about um, the teaching of civics in schools. And we can map that back to a piece of legislation that in theory was good, but it had unintended consequences. And that was No Child Left Behind. It eroded the civics, the humanities, the arts, all of that kind of stuff. And as a college professor, one of the last years I was teaching, I was stunned at the number of students coming in that had no context at all about mm -hmm. civics or civic responsibility or three branches of legislation, um, any, three branches of government or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I get it. And in some respects, we're trying to make the world better, but we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That was that piece of legislation. But in addition to that, we have some incredible teachers in our state that are trying to weave it in. And New Hampshire just recently passed a piece of legislation, SB 216, which is more time on civics, which is mandating right. that we have more time for civics education in the schools um, and looking at a way of integrating it in the elementary school level and middle school and high school. You talk about um, 
your first, you know, be informed. The challenge uh, that we have nowadays is there's so much misinformation and sure. disinformation and uh, the import of us making informed decisions. Where's the reliable data? How do we triangulate and find the reliable data to make those informed decisions? Like you made a lot of really good and thoughtful points and you ask an important question. So let me get to your question. But first, uh, you're right. Civics has lost uh, something of the place it had. The analogy I use, it may be flawed, is musical chairs. Uh, well, and when the music stopped, it turned out there wasn't a seat anymore in many classrooms or many schools or universities for civics. I don't think there was an anti-civics movement, right. but as you put it, STEM and other things and people say, oh, this is a priority. We got to do more of this, more of that. Well, something had to give. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many uh, credits. There's only so many courses. There's only so much t teacher training and civics lost out again, not out of what well, wasn't the purpose, but it was the result. Right. And I think we have to acknowledge that and we have to fix it. And my way of fixing it is that, and I think what New Hampshire's doing is really good. It's, a, it's admirable and it's something of a model that we ought to uh, make it a requirement. Uh, and uh, and I, I, in my goal, and it's what I'm committed to, is that, it's, you know, if you want to say no child left behind when it comes to civics, uh, I want to make it impossible to graduate from a high school without having some civics under your belt. I want to make it impossible to get a college diploma without some civics on your belt. We would never think of graduating somebody from high school or college who couldn't read or count or, or write or think critically. Why do we think it's okay to graduate them and have them totally unprepared to be an informed, active citizen of this, of this country? I, I simply think we're derelict. So uh, we've got the problem, however it came about. I have no illusions it's gonna be easy to fix it. Again, we've got limited resources in education. Uh, at times we won't be able to, you know, it won't be easy to agree on what ought to be the content of a civics education. But the reason I wrote this book, the reason I do think conversations like this is I wanna start a national conversation about this. And I think what New Hampshire is doing again is a, an important step in the right direction. You look, and then at the end you raised what I think is a critical point, which is it's one of the contradictions of the moment. Here we are, we get up in the morning, we're flooded by uh, information. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is misinformation. And I don't know about your world, mine doesn't come where the misinformation has little yellow post-it notes on it saying this is bad, or other information comes and says this is accurate. It doesn't work that way. And so I think what we have to teach is the equivalent of information hygiene. You know, we wouldn't in the cyber age, uh, you know, you shouldn't write down your password uh, on a, again, I'll use a yellow post-it note and put it on your keyboard. That's really bad hygiene. Uh, your password probably shouldn't be password one, two, three, four. That's pretty bad hygiene. Probably shouldn't share your password with others. We can go on. Okay, so why don't we think about information hygiene? Why don't we think about where, what ought to be the good rules? Well, maybe it's multiple sourcing. You wouldn't go to only one place for information. You want to learn about where you're getting your information from. Does this place have political bias? Does it uh, authenticate uh, facts? One warning signal would be, is it social media? Think of that word, social media. It may be a great place to meet friends, but it's social. It's not called factual media. It's not called serious media. So by and large, social media ought not to be a place uh, where we go. One way to combine the two things we just talked about here, civics and this, is that part of a civics curriculum, I would argue, ought to be what some people now call either information hygiene or information literacy. New Jersey, uh, a state you may have heard of to your south, uh, has, is, has instituted a requirement for information literacy. So high school students will get schooled not on what to think, but rather on how to think critically, how to consume critically. How is it, how do I know this is a fact? Uh, how do I check it out? And that's a really useful skill in this age where we're so, we're so flooded. So I would simply say that to, uh, again, if Jefferson's idea 
is that the most important element of being a good citizen is to be informed. It's, it's gotten both easier and more difficult to get informed in the information age. Right. So what we have to do is, is teach, again, the, again, you want to call it literacy or hygiene or rules, rules of the road. And that ought to be part of what we do in our, in our schools. So that way, when people leave schools, they're, they're, they got the tools they need. They're armed for all the stuff that's going to come at them. So true. Um, part two, chapter two talks about get involved. Uh, you discuss the import of participating in the election process, casting our vote. Additionally, you mm -hmm. talk about becoming civically involved in our communities. And there are a variety of ways in which we can do that. There appears to be a strong connection between involvement and Chapter 7's promoting the common good. Do you believe, and if so, why, that the more involved we become, the more informed we become, the greater understanding we have for the whole, and as a result, the more invested we are in promoting the common good. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I think it's possible, but not automatic. One could be involved without being informed. Uh, there were people involved on January 6th. They weren't, uh, they weren't, I would argue, informed citizens. They may have thought they were patriots, but they weren't. Patriots don't violate the, the law. They don't overturn elections that have been shown to have been carried out uh, freely and, 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 and fairly. So uh, simply being involved is not a, it's not a guarantee. Uh, I'd say it's probably more the other way, that if you think about the common good, that it's in your interest, not simply as an act of uh, charity or even religious ethics, but it's just also out of self-interest. Uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. If everyone in this society were to do a bit better, we'd all benefit from it, whether it's our, our, our health or, or economically, the demands on government would be, would be less, so our taxes could be lower. So we have, a, again, not simply an ethical interest in one another and to do the common good, but we also have a self-interest. We saw that, by the way, during COVID. We had a self-interest to, 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 to see that people were vaccinated or that masks were available, I would argue was a way to promote the common good. But we all benefit from the common good because we are part of it. Uh, this is a fabric. This is a society. This is a community. So uh, if we contribute to it, we also get a lot from it. And indeed, one of the reasons I use the word obligations so often is obligations have an element of backwards and forwards or contract. You, know, you and I have obligations to one another in both ends. We, we both have obligations to the country, but in our obligations to one another, we both give and we benefit. It's a two way street. And I think that is uh, important. So again, I think doing, at, doing things in the common good, even though there's an ethical argument for it, uh, going back to, the Bible, the idea that we're our brothers and our sisters keeper. We have certain ethical responsibilities. But my argument is in a society, in a democracy, we all benefit or lose depending upon the how our fellow citizen is, is faring. I want to go back a minute um, and just underscore when we talked about money being spent on STEM, money being spent on civics. Uh, there's been research done where it shows 50 cents is spent on civics while $50 per student is spent on STEM. There's a big disparity there. We know that. We also know the import of having a strong historical civic understanding and background. Take COVID. You started talking about COVID. I'm a business person. So I'm looking at it through the lens of a business person. And I'm saying... Our HR professionals during COVID were on the front lines deciding how we're going to deploy our employees, how we're going to keep them um, healthy, all of this kind of stuff. Where do I go to find information? And all of them were relying on their civic knowledge. Who in the community do I have to talk to? Who are the first responders? What are all those kinds of things? And we take it for granted that our employees all know that, but they don't. And so again, it underscores the import of civic education. We talk how important STEM is, and it is. 
And you hit the nail on the head when you talked about there's only so many hours in the day in the schools. So there's got to be a way of looking at our education system and can we integrate it? Can we look at it in a different way so that we make sure we're um, touching upon the key elements of civics and that our students are graduating from high school and college with these skills because they become essential in the work environment, whether people realize that or not. From a business perspective, I'm saying the more our employees understand civics, the community, how it interacts with us economically, socially, et cetera, the better um, corporate citizens we are overall. So from that perspective, maybe you agree, maybe you don't, but I think it's not just education. It's everybody that has to take a role in this, um, making sure our young people, even our contemporaries, understand civic, our obligation, our duties. Thoughts say, on that? I could say amen. Uh, agree uh, very, very strongly. You mentioned business leaders. They can do things to help, for example, to make it easy for employees to vote. Uh, take time off or to work at, at the polling stations uh, around an election. They could give people leaves of absence to go work in government. When they hire people, they could give preference to people who have done public service. They do for veterans. They could do for other forms of uh, public service. So I think there's lots of things that, that business leaders could do to help this democracy. After all, think about it. If you run a business, you are dependent on the rule of law. You are dependent. You may, it's a little bit like oxygen. You may not quite notice it, but think how well or poorly your business would do if social order breaks down or if the government becomes politicized, uh, the IRS or the Justice Department. You're not going to like that if you're uh, a business. So I think there's more that businesses uh, need to do. It's, again, out of a, what I'm trying to write and talk about are things that are in the collective interest as well as self-interest because you know, I'm a realist. But I get what motivates people. So this is not, again, a kind of charity. This is, a, yeah, it's good for everybody, but it's also good for us. And I want, so I want businesses to, to, play, their, to play their part. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, important. And they have uh, lots of things. Plus, the last I checked, business people have another hat. Yes, they're you know, the CEO of this firm or the vice president of this firm, but they're also, they're also parents and neighbors. They pay taxes, personal taxes, as well as business taxes. Okay, so what about the school board? What about funds for education? What about the curriculum? And you know, again, they have the self-interest of young people coming out who are ready to be productive workers. So I think there's more they can do, both in their business capacity, but also just in their citizen capacity to, to see that uh, you know, our schools in particular, and since we're on the side, I say one other thing, Education's been the great ladder in American society. It's the great vehicle. It's, you know, the one thing you kind of have to do in this country is through the age of 16, hopefully longer, is go to school, get educated. So this ought to be a priority for us. This is the way that people get the skills they need to be successful in the society and in the economy. And if I could fix one thing, if I had a magic wand, it would be the quality and quantity of public education. Uh, and we really need to, to look hard because we it's not so much what we spend. It's really how we spend it. And you know this, given your background. And, and I, I just think that this, order, this needs to be a priority, more of a priority for this society. Because if we don't invest in education, then we're not investing in our, in our young people. And that will, that will come back to, to haunt us. Agreed. So now I'd like to invite our first student with her question for you, Dr. Haas. Um, Sophia B. from Alvern High School in Hudson, New Hampshire has a question based on chapter three, stay open to compromise. Sophia? Uh, good morning, Dr. Haas. My question is this, as I'm sure you know, in recent decades, we've seen a rise in polarization in foreign policy with both parties openly criticizing our foreign policy decisions, um, thus thre uh, threatening the image of a united and strong America. How do you propose you return to this tradition of politics ending at the water's edge through your idea of compromise? Well, thanks, Sophia. Uh, look, let me say one thing about compromise in general, then I'll, I'll get back to your question. 
uh, I specifically said, I, I, I didn't make the obligation to compromise. I made the obligation to stay open to compromise. And what I want people such as yourself is always to think about, well, if I compromise, what am I likely to get? And am I better off with that as opposed to refusing to compromise? In most cases, in my experience, it's better to get something than nothing. Uh, but there may be those moments when you say, I can't compromise on this. It's such a matter of principle or whatever. Uh, but, I want to, but I want people to think it through. And I want them to think about, okay, what are things likely to look like tomorrow if we compromise? What are things likely to look like tomorrow if we don't compromise? Which way are we better off? And in my experience, you're usually better off if there's a compromise, because then at least you have something. Maybe it won't be everything, but it's more, something. Last I checked, something is more than nothing, and uh, so that's why I'm I'm inclined to uh, to favor it. But again, there may be those instances when you don't look in foreign policy. It's like anything else. There's nothing different, if you will, or other than the subject matter about foreign policy. Um, you know, we were talking before about Ukraine. I mean, you've got this legislation that's there about aid to uh, assistance to Ukraine, Israel, uh, Taiwan, and so forth. I think all of these in principle are, are in the interests of the United States, which is you know, the way I measure it. Uh, right now we're having trouble making a compromise. You, know, you can argue it on the merits, and I think the merits are strong, you are, but that's obviously not persuading people because they're not, at the end of the day for them, this is not a foreign policy conversation, it's a political conversation. Let's be honest. So, and or to come back to your question, the politics aren't stopping at the water's edge. They're not respecting that norm. They're not respecting that, uh, that unwritten rule of American democracy where we don't let politics get in the way of what's good for the country. They are letting politics get in the way of what's good for the country. Then it falls again on us, the voters. And we have to uh, make it clear about what we support. And quite honestly, the political price that will be paid by those who, who act contrary to, uh, to that. that that's, that's where we'll, you know, the government's gonna make the foreign policy. What we have, but since it is largely a political calculation that's going on in Washington, then we have to make clear what are the political consequences of what they are doing. Thank you, Sophia. Next, we have Ryan C. from Pittsfield Middle High School in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Uh, his question is based on Chapter nine, support the teaching of civics. Ryan? Hey, Dr. Haas. Um, <clears throat> the question I had coming out of my reading was, how do we stress the importance of civic education to those who, have may, have, who may have been jaded in the past um, of our political state and everything politics? Look, it's a good question, Ryan. And I think uh, the fact that use your word people are jaded is real and it, 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 in some cases it, it motivates them not to vote they say or they just get they distance themselves from politics they say you know everybody's the same or it won't make a difference and i think what civics education shows is it teaches you a little bit about the history of american democracy and while it hasn't been perfect it has delivered some extraordinary things uh, both at home and abroad. And this country is a very different place than it was 50 or 100 or 200 years ago. And I would say it's uh, on balance a significantly better uh, country than it was. Uh, we live longer. We have more freedoms. More of us have freedoms. Uh, we're much wealthier. Uh, we have more rights. So, you know, not bad. Not bad. Not perfect. But, but yes, I think you have, we have to make the case that uh, American democracy has delivered. There's reasons now we see it in many cases frustrated, but that can be addressed. That can be fixed again, but it's not going to get better by itself. And what I think we want to, you know, I keep coming back to the first two obligations. We got to get people informed and then we have to motivate them to get involved. And I think the way you motivate people to get involved is uh, you show it can make a difference and it can make a positive difference that you may not like government, I understand that people get jaded, but government makes a difference in virtually every aspect of our life. What government does and what it doesn't do makes a difference for better and for us. Uh, I expect both of us would agree we want it to be for better. Okay. Well, the way government 
makes it for better is the best people go into it and work. Or even those who don't go into it and work say, hey, you do stuff that's bad, you're going to pay a penalty. You do stuff that's good, you're going to be, you know, I'll vote for you. So I think, uh, I think I have to make the connections, almost draw the dots, connect the dots, excuse me, between um, government and people's lives. And I think that can reduce, again, the alienation or the sense that uh, it doesn't matter or it's inevitably bad. But at times it's going to be an uphill struggle because people turn on the news. They see what's going on or not going on. They get alienated or frustrated. And, but that has to then, we have to get them involved enough so it has consequences. But it's a good, you, you raise a really important point. Thank you, Ryan. Now, please join us, REP, from Groveton High School up north, Groveton, New Hampshire, with your question from Chapter 5, Reject Violence. Good morning, Dr. Haas. My question for you today is, have you ever experienced the political violence you've described in chapter five? Uh, it's a good question. Um, and personally, very little in the sense that uh, you know, things aimed at me. Uh, what I, but, you know, I spent three years as the US envoy to Northern Ireland and political violence became, uh, for a while, for three decades, quite common there. It was known as the Troubles. Thousands of people lost their lives. We all saw what happened here on January 6th. We've seen uh, political violence there. In my lifetime, there's been any number of political assassinations of President Kennedy, of his brother Robert Kennedy, of Martin Luther King, uh, and, and, and others. So in this society, we've all... Uh, experience violence and I've seen it or around the world and what we see now is uh, people in public life facing more threats as recently as this week I don't know if you noticed one of the two Republican candidates for president Nikki Haley former governor of South Carolina asked for secret service protection why because of the threats so that worries me that judges and political public officials and candidates are are, are being threatened. Uh, you've had people leave politics and they've said that one of the reasons I left is because of the threats made against me or my family. So you know, this to me is a uh, truly, truly toxic and dangerous uh, you know, to descend into to, to violence. Uh, it's not impossible. I don't, you know, I, again, we've seen some warning signals and there's been some books in recent years about civil conflict coming to America. And it's not science fiction. And you know, we're a heavily armed country. We've got very deep and passionate differences. And so yeah, I think it's really important to preach the importance of nonviolence. I think religious leaders, the people who give sermons in churches, and synagogues and mosques, what have you, have an obligation to, to preach nonviolence. I believe uh, political leaders have a, an obligation to do the uh, to do the uh, same. But I, I take the threat of it seriously. It's not something I would have said if we had had this conversation ten years ago. But but I take it more more seriously. And I you know again I've seen what it can do to and I've seen it happen in a modern Western society like uh, Northern Ireland. And which is part, you know, obviously, it's part of the United Kingdom, it's part of Europe. And so we can't be sanguine and say it can't happen here. Unfortunately, it can happen here. It has happened here and it could happen here. It's, to some extent, it's happening here at a, at a low level. We want to make sure the level of it stays extremely low or better, the better yet disappears. But like everything else uh, I write about, I don't think we can just be complacent. We can't be sanguine. I think we have to delegitimize political violence. And again, I, I turn to religious and political leaders to do that. And then some other thing, and then law enforcement, like we saw on January 6th, to back it up. There has to be a, a recognition that there's simply no place for politically inspired uh, violence. And I'd say one other thing, you, know, you, you look at some of the things where we've had change in the country and in the world, Nonviolence is a really powerful tool. We look at Ella, the civil rights movement and so forth. 
we've seen that uh, nonviolence, as was preached by Martin Luther King, uh, as we've seen in other societies, uh, in India, for example, by Gandhi, nonviolence can be a really powerful tool. The use of violence can undermine your agenda. And nonviolence can be a very powerful uh, discipline. And I think it's important that people understand that. Thank you, Ari. Our second participating student from Alburn High School, Hudson, New Hampshire, is Ryan G. And he'll ask his question based on chapter 10, put country first. Ryan? Good morning, Dr. Haas. Uh, so my question is in the media, we often hear America first and America only used interchangeably. And how can we, as you would put it, put our country first without first a conversation that helps us define the differences between these two? Ryan, it's a really good question. It's unfortunate it's the same word, uh, first. America first is a slogan that historically was associated with American isolationism. Often it was uh, very prejudiced against certain Americans, against immigration and, and, and uh, so forth. It's been resurrected uh, now. So let's just put that in a box. When I say putting the country first, it has nothing to do with America first. When, uh, when I say put the country, I could say put the country before any consideration of your political party. Put what's good the, for the country before any consideration of what's good for your own ambition. That's what I'm trying to preach. That a uh, good example would be somebody like Liz Cheney, former congresswoman, who basically stood up for her political principles. You may agree with them or not, but I think uh, what was was impressive is she did so understanding she would likely pay a political price for it, and she did. She lost uh, the primary bound. She based, and then she said, "Look." There's more important things than keeping your seat in Congress. It's not worth selling out your principles to do that. And there's lots of ways to make a difference in this country. So I admire that. I respect that. Uh, and I think there's other people in public life have done the same thing. And I'll be honest with you, I don't have a lot of respect for people who put their party or their personal ambitions uh, before what's good for this country. So again, you know, even though the word first shows up in more than once, to me, you know, what I'm talking about is not America first. It's putting the country before these other considerations, which ought to be secondary. Thank you, Ryan. Our final participating student is Elizabeth A. from John Stark Regional High School in Ware, New Hampshire. Her question is based on Chapter 8, Respect Government Service. Elizabeth? Good morning. Um, in Obligation 8, you discuss how increased participation in government service can help unite American citizens under a shared experience and help de-alienate them from their government. I feel that a mandated approach like that in Israel would help raise participation in government service, but that many Americans might object to it as too much of an infringement on liberty. Current programs, like some of those you mentioned in the book, such as the National Civilian Community Corps and Teach for America, might not have these objections, but it seems that they do not have the impact or the reach of a mandated program. What do you think would be the best path forward in getting more Americans involved in government service? Well, first of all, Elizabeth, you summarized it spot on. Uh, I would love to see more Americans do public service programs. It's a great training program for them. It helps their communities or cities or states or the country. There's work that needs to be done. And I love the fact that it brings together people who ordinarily might never meet. One of the great things, uh, Tom Brokaw is a famous journalist of my generation. And Tom used to write about World War II being the greatest generation. And you had more than 10 million Americans in the military at one point or another. And it brought together people from different geographies, different economic backgrounds, different colors, different religions, you name it. And that was great. And they discovered things about one another, about themselves and about America. And I worry now that we don't have enough of those shared or common experiences, so we're, we're increasingly separate. Uh, but you, what you allude to, I think is also right. If we try to make it mandatory, I think we, you know, we'd have massive protests on our hands. Americans don't like being told they have to do things. So if you want something to happen, but you don't want to make it mandatory, the question then is, how do you incentivize it? How do you make it uh, people more wanting to do it? Well, one is you pay them for it. And, you know, so we have an all-volunteer army, by the way. We offer people great experience. We pay them. 
and it can change their lives for the better education training opportunities So the same thing we ought to for other forms of public service we ought to pay them and offer them training and and so forth and i mentioned it before employers could give preference we, employers could say we will hire people say who spend two years one or two years in a gap year after high you know at some point early on and they will develop skills or colleges could say hey you go spend one or two years after high school doing this, we will give you preference as if you had an A average. Uh, even if you only had a B average, but you do this, we're going to jack it up because we think this is so valuable, what you will learn about yourself and about others, and you'll pick up new, new skills. Uh, so I think there's ways we can incentivize it. Several states are doing it. Uh, California's taken the lead. Maryland's now getting involved. And I think we're learning uh, they're all, they're basically piloting different projects. So we're, we're learning what, what, what works and so forth. So, I, uh, but that's the way to do it. I, again, we don't take well to mandates. I mean, um, in places like Australia, for example, you have to, you know, you have, you have to vote. You know, there's a mandate. Uh, I don't think Americans would like that. So I, I, we have to operate under certain constraints and I'd say the same thing. You know, we're not going to have a draft. We don't need it for the military. Americans wouldn't want it for public service. So again, you're left with incentivizing it. So you got to make it really valuable, both for the experience as well as for the uh, the long term. And I think we can do it. And I think we could get millions of Americans to do it. And the other benefit, again, is I like people doing things where the government's involved. I don't want the government to be the enemy. I, I hate the phrase deep state. I want the best and brightest. I want you and the other students on this call and others to say, yeah, I'd like to go work for government at some point in my career. I can really do interesting, important things. So that's what uh, I'm hoping to, to bring about. Thank you, Elizabeth. I know you had a second question prepared. I don't know if you have it with you and you're ready to, to ask that question. If not, I have it, and I'd be let, I'd be happy to ask on your behalf. Yeah, I have it right here, actually. Thank you. Please. So in Chapter 6, which is value norms, you speak about how norms or shared values and traditions are vital to the cohesion of society and the smooth running of democracy. Do you feel like America today is experiencing a crisis of norms, or have norms always been this varying and, and um, diversive? No, another good question, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think it's gotten worse. I, we talked before about the norm that uh, politics should stop at the water's edge, that we don't let domestic partisan politics get in the way of coming together on foreign policy. Well, that's exactly what's happening right now. There's other times historically we've disagreed on foreign policy, but it was largely over issues. You know, people could be on both sides of the Iraq war debate or the Vietnam war debate. This isn't over the issues. This is over politics. This is fundamentally different. Or historically, when elections are free and fair, we accept the results. You don't always win in a democracy. Okay, but you accept that in part because that's what makes a democracy a democracy. Well, suddenly we have millions of Americans who have been persuaded or persuaded themselves that what was a free and fair election wasn't. And some of them are willing to use violence to overturn it. Uh, so we pay a real price for the violation of these uh of these uh, norms. And uh, yeah, I do think it's gotten worse. And we can argue about why or how, but it's the same remedy. The only way to address it, to fix it, is for Americans to get involved politically and say, hey, those of you who violate important norms without any grounds for doing so, you lost my vote and I'm gonna go vote for your opponents. Enough Americans do that, we'll see greater respect for norms. Again, uh, politicians may not wake up in the morning feeling responsible, but they do wake up every day feeling responsive. And what we have to do is uh, give them the incentives to do the right thing and the disincentives to do the wrong thing. So it's, it's on us. But norms, I'd say one of the norms are really important because you can't, you can't, not everything can be a matter of law. Not everything can be a, a hard and fast rule. You, you, there's always scope for interpretation or individual discretion. And what you wanna do is influence behavior where you can't say it's illegal to do things, it's simply not right. 
It's not in the common good. It's the wrong thing. And what we've got to do is uh, get people, again, more likely to do the right thing, even if it's not necessarily uh, convenient. And that, again, that's on us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Sophia, would you join us again? I think you have your second question all set and ready to go. Yeah, I have my second question regarding obligation for remain civil. Um, and it was, how can we address the incivility on social media as it pertains to politics, often leading to hostile communication, anger, and violence? Uh, Sophia, it's a real problem. And the, but part of the problem is both the Supreme Court and the Congress have decided not to get involved much. So they have eventually said, the people who provide, as we would say, the pipes, uh, the internet, the social media sites, they are not responsible for the content for the most part. So that means there's gonna be a lot of stuff on social media that's gonna be crude or uh, worse. Uh, and the fact that a lot of social media is done uh, anonymously, a lot of people discover a lot of courage when they can't be held accountable. It's a real problem. And it can, as you know, it can get really vicious, get really ugly. Uh, and all we can do, I think, is uh, at the moment is make people better consumers of it and understand uh, what it is and what it isn't. And no one's forcing people to read this individual's tweets or whatever they are. I guess now it's on X, whatever you call what we used to call a tweet. Uh or no one's saying you've got to go to this site, which is inaccurate or crude or racist or sexist or whatever whatever their particular uh, cause is. Um, so I don't know any way, you know, the whole free speech thing make, gives people lots of protections to say really ugly things. Um, there's not a lot that can't be said. There's a lot that shouldn't be said, but that's a different thing. So I think when things that can be said, but shouldn't be said or said, then it's up to us to essentially avoid the, not read them, not, not, not give them the, uh, not give them the uh, attention that they, they shouldn't get. Thank you, Sophia. I'd like to ask the other students, Sophia, don't go away, come back. Um, I'd like to ask the other students to join us now. I have a question that I'd like each of you to respond to individually, and I'm going to ask you in order of Ari first. What is the most significant takeaway you've had from reading the book and this experience and what thoughts would you like to share with your fellow students? Ari? Um, something that I took away from this book is that I appreciate the conversation you started by writing it. I think that sometimes people shy away from talking about these topics, but here you openly share your thoughts and ideas. I think that these are crucial conversations to be having as Americans. For example, thinking about what happened on January 6, 2021 is terrifying. It made me think that we cannot maintain our democracy if people do not want one. Your book shows how we can participate in our democracy to keep it alive. Thank you for having this conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Ryan G, most significant takeaway you had from reading the book and the experience and what you'd like to share with your fellow students? Yeah, as I was reading it, I really thought that the Bill of Obligations does an incredible job at defining how I as the individual and I as the citizen can get involved in my community and in my state and in my country to make a change. And when I can identify things personally that are uh, unjust or going wrong, how I can get involved and cause there to be change and become an active member of my community. And I thought that it was put in a very uh, detailed way where uh, anyone in America is able to understand this and take away how what they can do to be the best citizen that they can be. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Elizabeth, what's the most significant takeaway you have from reading the book and the experience and thoughts you want to share with fellow students? Um, for me, reading the book and participating in this event really helped reveal to me, I think, a lot of the nuances that hold together and define sort of the fabric of American society and democracy and really change the way that I approach and view citizenship, not only in myself, but with others, and really helped to sort of illuminate how 
the the really important role that all of us um, both individually and cooperatively have in um, the future of government in our country. Thank you. Ryan C., most significant takeaway, reading the book and experience and thoughts for your fellow students. I think for me, <clears throat> sorry, I think for me, though, it's very easy to get pessimistic when it comes to like our political environment and democracy as a whole. And I think like the most important thing the book really showed is that we shouldn't let those shortcomings um, right now make us like give up on making our nation better. And I think that's incredibly important. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Sophia, we'll finish up with you. Most significant takeaway you had from reading the book and experience and thoughts you want to share with your fellow students. I think the biggest thing that I'm going to come away with is a new appreciation for education and civics in general. I totally agree with what you guys were saying at the beginning of the discussion. And it really puts the why in how we learn about uh, civics at school and outside of school as well. Um, yeah, and it really makes me want to educate myself and be more involved in my democracy. Wonderful, thank you. Now I have a question for Dr. Haas. What's the one key thought or nugget of information that you would like our viewers and participants to reflect on from this conversation? First, I gotta say, it's the rare conversation about these subjects that leaves me feeling better. And uh, these five young people leave me feeling better. Uh, their attitude, their interest, their commitment uh, is great. And so uh, you're doing something right in New Hampshire, must be in the water or something. Uh, <laughs> but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's heartening to, uh, to see and uh, hear. Look, what I'd like people to come away with is that American democracy is precious. It's been the world's great experiment. We're coming up on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in two and a half years. And, but it's also fragile. And it's up to us to, uh, to keep it. And good things just don't happen, but they happen because good people uh, make them happen. So in this case, for the next year, this year, 2024, I want people to... Uh, meet the obligations of being informed and being involved. And then in down the road, we can talk about how to get civics into more schools, about how to do more uh, with public service. So there's lots of things that can and should be done to uh, protect and preserve and promote uh, this democracy of ours, which for all of its uh, flaws and faults has, been a, uh, has made an extraordinary contribution to, uh, to this, uh, this country and to uh, our lives, to those who came before us and has the potential to do the same for those who will come after us. That's great. So the book is rich with information, history and thought provoking content. We only scratched the surface today and we hope that you will consider reading the book and discussing it with your friends, family and colleagues. The one thing that was very apparent and clear is while we have 10 good habits of good citizens. They're not black and white. I think Dr. Haas clearly explained it's in context, right? So when we talked about first, putting country first, it's in context. And we want to be clear that it's not black and white and that we have a duty and an obligation to understand and try and meet others part way so that we can make a stronger nation overall. We have been very fortunate in this country. We are a melting pot. I come from that generation. My ancestors all immigrated from Greece. So I really appreciate what the United States of America offers to all of us. I want to thank you, Dr. Haas. Thank you, Sophie B., Ryan C., R.E.P., Ryan G., Elizabeth A., for joining us today. A very special thanks to your teachers, Mallory Lanku, Brett Vance, Logan LaRoche, Dan Marcus and Christian Cheatham. Thank you also to the many people that made this event happen, including the Treat Foundation, New Hampshire Humanities, New Hampshire Civic Staff, New Hampshire Public Broadcasting System, and the New Hampshire Council on Social Studies. We would suggest you check our website, newhampshirecivics.org next week for information on how to access the recording. There will be a survey distributed later today and we ask you please complete it as it informs future events. Thank you, and that's a wrap. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.